Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Edward M. Kennedy for hosting today's session, the evaluation of so-called liver chemistries with Dr. Doug Douglas Levin. Dr. Levin is a retired assistant professor of medicine from Ohio State University. For 32 years, he practiced internal medicine in a physician group practice in Columbus, Ohio. At OSU, he focused mainly on hepatology. Uh, Dr. Levin later redirected his focus from endoscopy suite to outpatient hepatology. Throughout his career, his primary focus was on students, residents, fellows, and postgraduate education. He received teaching awards in 2010 and 2015 for student teaching. And in 2019, he was also the recipient of the Fred Thomas Teaching Award for Fellow Teaching and a Special Teaching Award for the Department of Pathology. And we are so very lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Levin, when you're ready. Well, thank you very much. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about so-called liver chemistries. Um, <clears throat> the last time I gave this talk, one of the participants complained that I was talking too much about subspecialty care. And in truth, that's not so. So I realized that I had not uh, done a very good job of identifying the relationship of your liver chemistries to figuring out what's wrong with the patient. The goal is not to figure out the liver chemistries. The goal obviously is to figure out what's wrong with your patient. Um, no disclosures. Now let's talk first about AST and ALT. One of the things that this emphasizes is the fact that the so-called liver chemistries are not specific. The AST, originally called the SGOT, was actually first introduced in medicine in the, in the uh, 1960s to identify myocardial infarction. It, it uh, preceded um, the uh, CK, which preceded the ultra -proponent. I always laugh when I get a when I got a consult from uh, cardiology, why is our patient with a heart attack having liver problems? Which of course wasn't true. Uh, so there are a lot of things that can cause these uh, to become elevated and you have to keep that in mind. These enzymes catalyze the transfer of alpha amino groups to the alpha keto group of ketoglutarate. Um, the AST, the aspartate to oxaloacetate and alanine pyruvate, the ALT. Again, they're not specific to the hepatocyte. <clears throat> the ALT uh, uh, origin is exclusively from the cytosol, that is a sap in the, in the uh, cell. The AST is from both cytosol and mitochondria. In health, most of the AST is from the cytosol. The AST is, clears more rapidly from the serum. If your AST is greater than the ALT by two to one or three one, of course, you're going to think alcohol. However, cirrhosis itself from any cause can do this, as can physical labor and strenuous workouts. <clears throat> the elevations with workouts are not pathologic. <clears throat> Even the pros have trouble with some of these things. Uh, I went, I, I did a Zoom uh, course with some of the uh, big honchos in hepatology, and it was an excellent course. And then they had some cases. And one was a 62-year-old, described as a muscular 62-year-old man, and his AST and LT were elevated. And it took him forever to ask the obvious question. And the question is, when's the last time he worked out? If, if you see somebody who comes in is otherwise well and is, is uh, fit, you ask him about the workout. It takes about seven days to clear. And what you do is uh, try to get them not to exercise for a week. And that can be very challenging. But this is not pathologic. It's not going to lead to rhabdomyolysis. It's how human muscles work. If you're a lion, you get big muscles. If you're a human being, big muscles have metabolic cost. And famine has been a threat to humankind forever up to the present time, 2023. So when we're not working out, our muscles tend to atrophy under the influence of something called myostatin. Lions don't have myostatin. You can't earn a living as a lion if you've got skinny muscles, but we can. So um, you have to realize <clears throat> that when you work out, you, you cause minor damage in the muscles. And that makes the enzymes go up. Don't do an extensive uh, evaluation of the liver if you see somebody coming in and fit. Ask them the question. 
the physiologic normals for men and women are really quite different from what your lab probably tells you. And I think this is a real issue. The physiologic normals uh, for the AST and LT are 19 for women and 31 for men. Now, if you go up to 25 for a woman or 35 for a man, it's probably not a big deal. But levels <clears throat> that are uh, less than twice normal with no other abnormality uh, are best observed longitudinally. Um, you know, that is, you, you check for viruses, you check for iron metabolism, you check for lipids to make sure that they don't have uh, uh, hyperlipidemia uh, or events of fatty liver. The problem with the labs is that they don't like um, these numbers. They look at a, the so-called normal distribution where two and a half percent at either end is considered abnormal. The problem is 25% of the world's population has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So to say that only two and a half percent at either end are abnormal is just wrong. It's, a, you know, 25% at one end are abnormal. This makes a really big difference. For instance, the guidelines in Europe for hepatitis B say that um, if you could have normal uh, AST and ALT and still have progressive viral hepatitis from something like hepatitis B. The problem is 40 is not normal. You can assume that there's some disease process going on there. The reason I think that they do this is because they're statisticians and they, their trade depends on having a normal bell-shaped curve. First of all, there's no evidence that most things we study distribute the way a normal bell-shaped curve does. But second of all, with the obvious uh, disparity between two and a half percent and 25 percent, it, it really becomes very misleading. And I, I think that does us a, a great disservice. Now, there is a poor correlation but between peak amino transferases and prognosis. For instance, the people who tend to have the highest uh, amino transferases after getting viral hepatitis, something like that, are health workers because we show up right away. It doesn't take us a week to, to get in, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very high. So that in itself is not. Uh, generally helpful. <clears throat> now, bilirubin is a catabolic product of heme metabolism, 80% from hemoglobin and 250 to 400 milligrams per day. Nearly, virtually 100% of serum bilirubin is, in health is unconjugated. Now, you won't see that on your lab either because the, the tests themselves are, are not very accurate. Whereas conjugated hyperbilirubinemia only occurs in hepatobiliary conditions. So, even though it'll tell you direct, indirect, and so forth, you can't take that too seriously. Now, one thing you want to know about is something called delta bilirubin. This is an albumin-linked bilirubin fraction and represents a significant fraction of the total bilirubin in hepatobiliary disorders, but not in health, not in neotates, or, or not with hemolysis. The clearance of delta bilirubin is slow, so 12 to 24 days, versus non-albumin-bound conjugated bilirubin. When is this important? Let's say you have a common duct stone and your bilirubin goes up. That's resolved. And yet two weeks later, your, your patient still is jaundiced. You check urine for um, bilirubin. And if it's negative, that's delta bilirubin. There's no active injury going on right now. This is just a residual of this very potent dye, if you will, staining uh, the, the albumin and so forth. So you, you check for delta bilirubin. Now, if you see somebody and the delta bilirubin is, and, and you and you check the um, your urine uh, bile for bilirubin, and it's positive. That means there's ongoing injury, and that's uh, of concern. So you should want to be sure you understand delta bilirubin. Also realize that the uh, scleroelectris takes a long time to clear as well. That doesn't mean you have active disease. Now, the congenital bilirubin elevations, unconjugated bilirubin is present in something called Gilbert's. It's an inherited a condition where the body doesn't metabolize um, the bilirubin very well, so it's 60%, 7% less. It really is a condition, not a disease. You may get more gallstones, but other than that, it, it's, uh, it doesn't cause any disease. You may actually be healthier because the bilirubin is an antioxidant. Grihernar is quite different. It's a, something that presents in childhood and is very serious. There are conjugated hyperbilirubinemias as well, Dubin-Johnson-Rotor syndrome, 
of being very, relatively rare, but something you'll see. Both are innocuous, uh, both with otherwise normal liver chemistries, but both you can diagnose with elevations of urine copaporphyrin in one. Um, I've only seen one rotor syndrome in my life, a uh, woman from Iran, but you do see du Dubin Johnson from uh, time to time. Again, check the urine couple pour from one, then you don't have to worry about it. Nothing more need to be done. Now, alkaline phosphatase is a, um, a test that we check and it's very undependable. There are multiple isoenzymes and there's no proven function, although intestinal alkaline phosphatase does detoxify endotoxin. Recent studies do suggest that liver alkaline phosphatase protects the alkaline status of the biliary epithelium and destroys endotoxin and other toxic bacterial products. However, you can get elevations of the um, alkaline phosphatase from liver, bone, placenta, and intestinal. And um, the um, alkaline phosphatase um, uh, varies depending on other aspects. For instance, intestinal alkaline phosphatase is seen in blood groups O and B, uh, who are ABH, RBC cell antigen secretors, particularly postprandial, and they're not pathologic. So you see somebody postprandial who has uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, it's not a disease process. It's, it's not even a condition. It's just something that happens on a genetic basis and is safely ignored. Liver alkaline phosphatase is elevated in intrahepatic and extrahepatic obstruction and with infiltration, such as with tumor or granuloma. However, the alkaline phosphatase is the least dependable serum test. It's higher in growing children, generally higher in younger men and older women, and can be mildly elevated in a variety of disease conditions and in health. What uh, <laughs> are the labs after sudden obstruction of, common, of the common duct? This is a really good question, and it, this issue really came up on my e-consult within the last week. They had a 39-year-old woman who had a BMI of 35 with otherwise well with a history of uh, cholecystectomy five years before. She keeps presenting with right upper quadrant pain, and her labs um, show um, a normal uh, alkaline phosphatase at 117 and a total bilirubin uh, of 1.6 with direct of 0.6. AST and ALT are quite high. Uh, a, um, a, a, ALT is over 1,000. AST is about 700. So when you look at that, you don't think of gallstones because you have been told that with, with extrapatic obstruction, the alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin will be up. And that's right except when it's wrong. And it's wrong when you check too early. So if you have somebody who presents in the ER with three hours of pain like this, and it's being recurrent, and you check this, you won't think perhaps of, intestinal, of uh, biliary obstruction because the alkaline phosphatase and, and bilirubin are not particularly elevated. But remember, if you check in two or three days, the alkaline phosphatase will be up, the bilirubin will be up, um, and, and then it'll fit your picture, what you think it is. So don't jump to conclusions for tests that are done very early. So that woman, for instance, everybody was thinking, is it hepatitis? Is it this? Is it is that? You want to think about what's her chief complaint? Her chief complaint is recurrent right upper quadrant pain. And the past medical history is significant for having a, a gallbladder removed. Again, I don't know anything about the operation. I don't know if they did a common duct exploration. Just don't know. But in this situation, you really want to look very carefully for a recurrent gallstones, a, st a stricture of the common duct, something like that. And sometimes it can be very hard to find. I remember a patient I had who had abdominal cancer, so he had pain all the time. That went away, and he still had pain. And his common duct was normal size, but his pain really sounded like recurrent biliary pain. So I asked one of my colleagues who did the endoscopic ultrasound to please take a look. And he didn't really want to because the imaging had been normal. And I pleaded with him, so told him to humor me. And he did. And of course, he found many multiple stones in the normal size common duct. This sphincterotomy removed the stones and the patient was fine. 
some a year later and he was, had been asymptomatic, even though he had biliary cirrhosis, all his liver chemistries are normal and he was clinically healthy. So again, um, you have to uh, integrate the timing uh, to the patient's problem. And again, your big challenge is not figuring out the liver chemistry. The big problem is figuring out how you can explain the chief complaint and the present illness. The AST and ALT are moderately uh, elevated um, in, in direct bilirubin, some bilirubin in the urine if you have obstruction of the common duct. And two or three days later, that's when it becomes evident. So you want to re remind yourself uh, if it's been a very short obstruction, the labs won't look the way you thought they might or should have. The albumin reflects relatively long-term synthetic function, can be lowered by renal or GI losses, and can also, obviously, if you're malnourished, starving, and so forth. So it, it can reflect um, proteinuria in the kidneys and so forth. So there are just many different causes. The proton or INR reflects short-term hepatic synthesis as long as vitamin K is available. Now, the CPK aldolase are often helpful to exclude a muscle source of the abnormal AST. That's one thing you can check with the guy who comes in with big muscles, you know, is, is the CK and aldolase elevated. Now, aldolase is hard to get. It's generally a send-out test, but the CK is very easy to get. Now, the serum protein electrophoresis is a very helpful test because it shows you the albumin. It shows you the alpha-1 globulins and the gamma globulins. And you can have problems with increased gamma globulins associated with autoimmune liver disease and no gamma globulins associated with the um, um, immune, um, you know, acqu acquired hypogamma globulinemia, which often will present with what looks like autoimmune hepatitis. So of course, they will not have plasma cells in the liver biopsy. But other than that, it, it looks pretty similar, despite the fact there is no gamma globulin. Now, immunoglobulin levels can be semi-helpful. They're not going to be definitive. But in autoimmune liver disease, the IgG is generally elevated. In alcoholic liver disease, IgA is often elevated. And in primary biliary sources, the IgM is often elevated. But again, uh, it's not 100%. Don't over-evaluate. Um, Don't overemphasize these kinds of things. Now, the alpha-1 antitrypsin Phenotype ZZ is associated with both neonatal, neonatal hepatitis and adult cirrhosis. Um, this is a relatively common condition and it's relatively easy to check. It's often made much worse by fatty liver. And you can't treat the alpha-1 trypsin deficiency other than, than through transplant. But if the patient is obese and you get them to slim down, this will often really slow down the progression of the disease. Now, TTG, IgA, identifies celiac disease, which can cause amino transfer elevations and occult liver disease. So that's something that, that uh, you want to check in patients who have liver function abnormalities that you can't explain very well. Now, the CBC identifies low platelets, and the low platelets are very important, both for prognosis because they're um, part of the MELD score, they're part of the FIB4, and it can also suggest progression of liver disease. Of course, there are many other causes of low platelets, including hematologic disorders, uh, but you do see pancytopenia, pancytopenia from chronic liver disease. So that's something you want to look at. And again, the platelet counts are very helpful. <coughs> the creatinine too is a very imp important prognosticator uh, with the MELS score management of end-stage liver disease. The LDH isoenzymes, are sometimes helpful to look for cardiac, hemologic, and muscle sources of some of these other lab tests. Again, it's a relatively hard test to get, but it can be tremendously helpful. Now, ferrin and iron iron body capacity and iron saturation are helpful to look for iron overload. But these tests are not so easy to interpret because they are often elevated with things like fatty liver, alcoholism, and acute hepatitis. Um, Generally, you don't have advanced liver disease unless the ferritin is above 1,000. But with fatty liver disease, it's often 500. I can't tell me how many patients you see with fatty liver disease who are referred because they are thought to have hereditary hemochromatosis when it's just 
non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The, um, that was the other thing that was funny about that panel, because they discussed this, they were talking about, well, if you have 50% saturation and your uh, ferritin is 500, you have to, you know, you want to get a check for um, hereditary uh, hemochromatosis, uh, look at the HFE gene, C2A2Y and H63D. Fact is that in general, saturation goes way up long before you get a lot of iron and it's unlikely to be positive. But that's something that's commonly repeated both in the literature and, and in lectures. And the truth is, is that's not really how it presents. If the ferritin is more than a thousand, you probably have to get a liver biopsy because if it is a hereditary hemochromatosis, uh, you wanna make sure that um, you understand what status they have because if they have developed cirrhosis before treatment, uh, they are vulnerable to liver failure, liver cancer, and so forth. So the cutoff, even if you're pretty sure they are, do have hereditary hemochromatosis, uh, for liver biopsy is about 1,000. Now, the GGT uh, is one of my least favorite tests. This test was used by um, the insurance um, uh, people to identify alcoholism, except it identifies 140% of the alcohol, or probably 1,000%, because generally it's elevated and it's not due to drinking. But um, tell the actuaries that. Um, it is recommended as, as checking the source of the alkaline phosphatase. I got into a shouting match with Dr. Kamath from uh, Mayo Clinic about this, because I don't think it is very good. I think it's often misleading and you'll make the wrong conclusion. And um, it's used to detect alcohol injury with the ASC is greater than the ALT by a factor of two or, or more. That's generally the, the pattern that you see. But you got to be very careful because just because the GT is elevated, um, is, it doesn't necessarily mean that, 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 that this is a problem. Um, and now how do you tell... Um, if the um, um, alkaline phosphatase is really from the liver as opposed from bone or placenta or um, something like that, intestinal, we've already said that intestinal is postprandial and is innocuous. Um, I think that um, you get an alkaline phosphatase isoenzyme. I'm not sure why people are so reluctant to get this test. It's not tremendously expensive, and it is very, very good at identifying these things. So if it's if you have intestinal alkaline phosphatase, who cares? It's not causing any disease, it's, and you've and understood it. Now, this is the only subspecialty thing that I brought up, and that is progressive familial hepatocolestasis one and two. Uh, um, both have normal GDTs, and for PFIC three. Uh, has an elevated GGT. Um, I've seen two cases my whole life. The only reason I even knew about them is when I took the liver transplant boards 13 years ago, uh, I, had a, I had to read the pediatric stuff, which I thought was very interesting and, and did indeed help me identify the two adults who had this kind of problem. Um, so uh, I don't think that very much of the GGT, particularly to try to confirm that the alkaline phosphatase is from the liver. I think you get an alkaline phosphatase isoenzyme uh, to be more confident. Now, the ANA, any, muscle, any smooth muscle antibody, any monoclonal antibody, any, and the um, anti-liver kidney microsomal antibody can be very helpful in detecting autoimmune liver diseases. I must say that the ANA, if it's naked, just that alone, is not helpful. Uh, there was a very good um, a lecture by a rheumatologist in the Maven project who talked about the ANA, basically the whole hour. And the ANA is a normal enzyme that recycles uh, nuclear products. And the older you get, the more worn out you are. So somebody like me with an ANA of 1 to 160, that's normal just because I'm old and worn out. You're recycling a lot of cells. So if you have an elevated ANA and nothing else and you're older, forget the whole thing. It's not a justification for doing extensive testing. Now, if it's part of the entire picture, that's a different story, obviously. 
Now, viral markers are obviously essential in detecting hepatotrophic viral illnesses, of which there are many sources. The, um, the, the pattern for hepatitis is that the AST and ALT are relatively higher than the alkaline phosphatase. And in cholestatic alkaline, the alkaline phosphatase and biliary are relatively higher than the AST and ALT. Now, you can eliminate most diseases if you have very high amino transferases, like 2,000. One is acute viral hepatitis, although the acute level, as I said before, doesn't necessarily mean so much. Shock liver does the same thing. And if the ALT over LDH is less than 1.5, think about hepatic ischemia. So if somebody who has a heart disease like cardiomyopathy and then has a myocardial infarction, that's a classic setup for uh, ischemia. Now, one of the things about ischemia is as bad as the injury may be, it's generally very reversible if you can correct uh, the cardiovascular system. Toxins can do it too. So poisons and so forth can do it. And acetaminophen, especially with chronic alcohol use, can cause very high amino transferases. Acetaminophen is you know, one of the most dangerous drugs you can buy over the counter. It's responsible for a huge number of liver transplants. And often, I mean, it can be do, used for suicide, but most often it's inadvertent. Uh, people actually on, this, on the dose that's recommended on the package, not infrequently, will get significant liver injury because the dose is too high. Um, in uh, England, for instance, acetaminophen comes only in bubble wrap where you have to pop each one out. It's amazing how that slows down people and cuts down the suicide rate dramatically. And yet the manufacturer lobbies and, and won't do that here in this country because it's annoying and it'll cut down sales. Uh, personally, um, I wonder why we really need it. I think the only use for acetaminophen is as an antipyretic in young children who can't take aspirin because of fear of Rye syndrome. Otherwise, I think it, it's not a good analgesic, it stinks. So I'm not really sure why, uh, why it's available in this country the way it is. Now, in renal failure, the ALT and AST will tend to fall. You sometimes see this in progressive renal disease. You think your liver disease is getting better. It's only because the, um, the artifact of testing with the interfering substances from which are normally cleared from the serum by the kidneys, but are not in this case, and so that they appear to drop, even though they, that shouldn't be the case. Now, with vascular disease, you'll, you'll have a high AST, ALT, and LDH, and a relatively low uh, alpha and phosphatase, uh, so uh, with ischemia. With malignancy, you'll often have a relatively high alpha and phosphatase and LDH and a relatively low AST and ALT, like metastatic disease uh, to the liver. So you can look at these patterns. I mean, they're not 100%. They can give you some hint as to what the problem is. Now, what about prognostication? Well, the INR is the single best test for it, assuming you're not on an anticoagulant, you don't have a congenital clotting disorder. The MELD score, which looks at creatinine, um, uh, INR, AST, ALT, is good. They often people use meld NA, which uses sodium as well. And in simultaneous elevations of AST, ALT, bilirubin, and INR and acute liver failure are associated with bad prognosis. And in primary biliary cirrhosis, the elevation of bilirubin per se is associated with a bad prognosis. Now, high bilirubins and acute viral hepatitis correlate with intensity and duration of the acute illness, but not necessarily mean that you won't recover uneventfully. So you do uh, see that. Now, I have some cases just to go over this. 46-year-old man has central obesity and is obtuse about his alcohol. His albumin is 4.1, alkaline phosphatase is 120, AST 180, ALT 60, and the GT is 840. His total bilirubin is four and his direct bilirubin is two. Other common and arcane diagnoses have been excluded. Is CT confirms hepatic steatosis. What is the etiology with a liver biopsy be helpful? And what's my point in this case? My point in this case is if the bilirubin is elevated, it's extremely unlikely to be due to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Elizabeth Brunn, a very well-known liver pathologist at Washington University, 
says, if you see E. cholestasis in a liver biopsy, it, think of something other than non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is one of the commonest things that, that the experts don't know. There's a great review of alcoholic uh, liver disease in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they talk about cholestasis in fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You don't see it. And yet it's commonly mentioned. Um, it's very, very frustrating to me because I think that, that that's a careful discriminant. So if you see elevations in bilirubin, think of something other than non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's probably alcohol in this, in this gentleman. A 76-year-old man has right heart failure. His ALT is 400 and his AST is 340. His total bilirubin is 3.4 and his direct is 0 0.3. His alkaline phosphate is 120, his INR is 1. What's the etiology of, of this process? Well, he's got congestive hepato, uh, hepatopathology. His uh, flow out of the liver into the IVC, into the heart is diminished. So the congestion has caused these elevations. Six weeks later, he has an MI. The ALT is 1500, the AST is 2140. The alkaline phosphatase is 140 and the total bill room is six and the direct bill room is 1.3. His INR is 3.4. What happened? Well, he has a myocardial infarction and now he has both low, um, he's got uh, central venous uh, uh, elevation and pressure and he's got low cardiac output and that causes a combined ischemia from both poor drainage and decreased um, hepatic artery flow and the CPK and troponin are likely to be elevated from the MI. So you can look at these kinds of things and it'll place it up. If you can get them over the MI and so forth, the tests will often go back to normal. Um, one of the things about the vascular injury short-term is that uh, the liver can often recover uneventfully. In fact, when you see these patients who have right heart failure, you know, from general heart disease, absent right ventricle or something like that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go for 20 years before they develop a significant scarring and so forth. The, the liver can put up with that for a pretty long time before it um, finally causes a reversible change. Now, an alcoholic is admitted having been found on the bathroom floor, the barroom floor, excuse me. His AST is 1,000, the ALT is 400, and the total bilirubin is 7.8. The direct bilirubin is 4.8, and the alkaline phosphate is what, 90. Is this compatible with alcoholic hepatitis? What other tests do you want? Well, the point of this is that the AST is 1,000. You don't see that in alcoholic liver disease. Generally, you don't see levels above 400. And um, the most likely thing is he has um, muscle injury from uh, being uh, uh, unconscious on the barroom floor. So this is a, a myopathy due to compression rather than actual uh, liver injury. So it's not the kind of thing that's simply alcoholic hepatitis. So you very well may have that too. So you want to check a CK and so forth uh, to make sure that, um, um, you know, see what his muscles are. But that's uh, likely to be the source of the injury in this particular person. This is a 32-year-old clinically well man who has celiac disease well-controlled with no detectable TTG. Years ago, a liver biopsy done to exclude autoimmune liver disease in the face of abnormal liver functions showed mild nonspecific features. His labs revealed an AST of 231, ALT 160, and otherwise normal liver chemistries. His exam is normal for a fit appearing young man with a thin build. Lab three days later was normal. What historical feature prompted a retest? Again, exercise. This is a great example somebody who's basically healthy, who works out, and you think his liver disease is getting worse, but it, it really almost certainly is not the case. So always think about um, other sources because, again, these tests are very misleading and not, not very specific. Okay, so hopefully uh, I've reviewed these liver chemistries, talked about the, the ways you can get caught up uh, in these things, emphasize the fact that um, they're complicated and by themselves, you have to integrate them with the patient's complaint 
the chief complaint and the history of prison illness, and that only by doing that will you be able to assess what these uh, so-called liver chemistry abnormalities are due to, to due to liver disease or some other source. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I could not get back into, could not un, um, start my video. Anyway, if you have any questions, please um, submit them into the Q&A box or use the raise hand feature, uh, especially if you're going to include medications, I will guarantee you I will mess them up. But uh, we do have a question. Uh, the first one is, under what conditions would you recommend getting a serum protein electrophoresis? Electrophoresis. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's a very helpful test, particularly when you're considering autoimmune liver disease, because it'll give you evidence of gamma globulin levels levels and also something called a beta gamma bridge. Um, if, so if you have a high beta gamma bridge and your other tests are compatible with it, that would support the diagnosis of autoimmune liver disease. So I think that can be very helpful. Um, whenever you consider autoimmune liver disease, you want to check the serum protein electrophoresis, the IgA and IgG and IgM, because they will give you some sort of hint. It's relatively unusual to have that. Again, except in agam globulinemia, you'll have what looks like autoimmune liver disease and you won't have any of these proteins. But, um, you know, it's not 100%, but it can be very helpful. Okay. Um, I know Deirdre has her hand raised. So I've given you the ability to unmute yourself. You'll be able to speak directly. Dr. Levin, but we can't hear you. Deirdre, if, you're, if you want to, you can, you can talk now. Sorry about that, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, um, we see a lot of patients with fatty liver disease and I'm just wondering what your recommendations for monitoring the labs would be for that and then how often we would do some ultrasound. Well, uh, fatty liver disease is the commonest liver disease we see now. And um, I think that um, what you have to do when you first see these patients is um, assess where they stand. Is it going, is it going to be a life-threatening kind of problem uh, or is it just something that you can work with um, as a general management of your patient. Um, the th things that you want to check um, are something called the FIB4, which looks at AST, ALT, age, and platelet count. This gives you some idea of whether there's any fibrosis. Um, most of the time, you probably want to, to get an ultrasound uh, to see what the liver looks like. And you want to sort of categorize these people into sort of incidental fatty liver. And there, there are really several different groups. If you're an obese diabetic, you have an 80% chance of have fatty, having fatty liver. And um, so if you, if you have somebody like that, not only do they have fatty liver, they tend to do worse. Um, if you um, have somebody with a, a FIB4, greater than 1.3. Now, if you're over 70, it's, it's two, because age is an important factor in the FIB4. Um, that su suggests advanced fibrosis, but the positive predictive value of the FIB4 isn't so great. The negative predictive value is very good. It's not perfect. One of the tools that we use is something called a fiber scan. Um, the fiber scan is a way of looking at something called transient elastography. It sort of bounces, it sort of pokes your liver and watches it shake like a bowl of jelly. And it can calculate how rigid it is. And this gives you some idea about whether there's fibrosis because that's a crucial element in management of these patients. You're gonna see a lot of them. <clears throat> and if they have fibrosis, that's a, that's a real problem. You want to be very aggressive of trying to get them to lose weight. Now about eight to 10% of people with fatty liver 
our normal weight. <coughs> They're harder to manage. Um, one of the, th now, if you wanna use the cosmetic medication, Ozempic or something like that, that's what it's all being used for to get people look skinnier. The fact is it's very effective at weight loss and weight loss seems to be uh, very important. Although it doesn't seem to have a direct effect, uh, effect on the fatty liver itself. But if you can control the diabetes and get them to lose weight, um, that probably is gonna do uh, a lot to prevent progression uh, of this disease. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <coughs> but fatty liver is um, really the disease that's dominating hepatology right now. <coughs> it's something I was interested in since 1983. And when I went to work at Ohio State in 2008, they asked me what I was liver interested in. I said fatty liver. They all thought I was nuts. Of course, now it, you know 40% of the publications are about this. So I would see these patients, check <coughs> their liver chemistries. Again, they tend not to uh, be jaundiced until very late. Um, check their Fib4s. Try to get access to uh, fiber scans. It's actually quite cheap. There are other things like Mayo Clinic uses MRE. That's much more expensive. It's probably a little bit better. And you could do something called a protein density fat fraction, which takes two minutes in an MRI machine, but you, that's, you probably will not have access to that for whatever reason. It's not become very popular. Some of it is, I think, that nobody likes to do procedures like fiber scan and, and uh, Fib4 that have a low price tag. Everybody wants to do the high price tag stuff, which is very, very unfortunate. And it's a sign of the psychopathology in our field. But those two things are pretty should be pretty cheap, but they're not. The, the, the fiber scan is very cheap. The problem with the fiber scan is so cheap, it's hard to pay off your machine. So that, that's a, a limitation in terms of access, but it is probably the, the easiest thing to get to. So I would check all these patients for fibrosis, trying to get something like a fiber scan, checking the Fib4. Again, if the Fib4 is 1.3 or less, you probably can uh, skip the, the fiber scan. You want to try to get them to control their sugar diabetes, control their weight. Diet is very important in this stuff. And uh, the Mediterranean diet, plus three others that are very ve vegetable based are really, I think the, the best approach. Um, things like the keto diet, I think are absolutely nuts uh, because they're pro-inflammatory. And, uh, you know, the, there's a sort of a long story starting with Ansel Keys, who recommended the low fat diet, uh, which killed more people I mean, I gained 30 pounds when I went on a low fat diet. It's amazing how fat you get eating all the stuff he told you to eat. And when I rationalized my diet, went on a Mediterranean diet, I lost the 30 pounds. So that was good. So I, I would emphasize screening with a Fib4, checking the lab, working on controlling their diabetes if they have it, um, and seeing them relatively frequently, at least, you know, two to four times a year to keep reinforcing the need to improve the diet. I often took uh, groups of patients through the supermarket with a dietitian to help them understand how you can buy healthful foods. Uh, and particularly for people on a budget, how you can eat the cheap apples, not the expensive apples, how you can um, you know, afford these things. Uh, because good food is much more expensive than uh, garbage food. And, you know, uh, Industrial foods that so many people eat, particularly kids, are, are really bad. You want to avoid fructose. Fructose is a six carbon sugar, but it's a five carbon ring. It's very hard to store as um, in, in, in uh, glycogen. So it's basically converted to fat. Um, and so you want to really uh, uh, avoid that as best you can. Now the fructose in fruits, fine. So if you eat apples or oranges or berries or something like that, the metabolism is so much slower because the body has to break down this complex food and it has a really an entirely different uh, effect. 
there's a pediatric um, uh, endocrinologist at Children's Hospital in Boston and at Harvard Medical School who's done some work which shows that these um, hyper-refined foods cause uh, marked elevations in glucose and marked elevations in insulin. And that this level of insulin actually suppresses the release of insulin from the base cells of the pancreas. And uh, it also drives the glucose into the fat in your body and in the liver and actually starves your muscles. So the muscles tend to get small. In fact, it's been known for some time that obese diabetics often have uh, sarcopenia, very weak muscles. You know, you think if you're carrying around all this weight, you that your muscles will get big, but it probably is the opposite because you're starving the muscles, driving all the, the, the uh, glucose into the uh, fat and the liver and in the belly particularly. Now, I should also go into a diatribe about how little I think about the, the um, um, use of BMI. BMI is a terrible test. It was invented by Adolf Kudelé, a, a, a Belgian polymath in 1832. And if you don't know anything about European history, you'll know that between 1760 and 1850, they had what they call a little ice age and the weather was terrible and crops failed and famine was a big problem. So Kudelé used this to collectively evaluate Europeans for famine, not obesity. And he specifically said it should not be used for individuals. So fast forward to, to Ansel Keys, who recommended that we use this, never validated. And in fact, it's terrible. And there are a lot of things that are bad about it. For instance, if you have someone, particularly a woman with a, a fat in the, in the buttocks and thighs, it's metabolically neutral. So somebody with that kind of body build, a BMI of 32 has got the same metabolic significance as a BMI of, of 25 in somebody else. East South Asians, a BMI of 19.6 is equivalent metabolically to a, a Caucasian of 25. And so when you have the FDA telling you that you need the BMI to choose a um, medication like Ozempic, GLP-1 agonist, uh, you're, you're excluding all these Asians who really need it because the FDA says you got to have a high BMI. So I think the whole thing is horrible and should be ended. I will say that in most of the conversations I have, with people at these talks, everyone else agrees. I don't think any ec real expert thinks this is a good idea. It's just that it's hard to change. Thanks, Dr. Levin. I do want to point out that Dr. Levin actually has a session on fatty liver disease, which you can always requ request. But if you don't want to request it and you'd like to see one of his previously recorded sessions, uh, I put that link in the chat. All right, next question. If someone has a mildly elevated ALKFOS, uh, less than two times upper limit of normal, but otherwise normal labs on almost every blood draw. Is there ever a time you would recommend further workup? Um, is your first step to try a fasting lab? I probably would check an ALKFOS isoenzyme. Again, young men, older women tend to have higher ALKFOS, and you, know, you might not be able to explain it. And you know, young men is probably because their bones are growing, and old women is because their bones are falling apart. Um, so I probably check that, and if if nothing really shows up, I'd quit. Uh, there's a very good chance it doesn't mean anything. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, but please feel free to to send them in. We'll hang out for a couple minutes. Uh, just a reminder that tomorrow you will get a um, an email from Zoom with the slide decks and the CME survey. You have to complete the survey to receive CME credit. Um, if you are sharing a computer, only the person that is logged in will get that email. You can still get credit and the, the email at the slide decks and everything. If you just send me your name and email address, I'll make sure you get all that information. Question, would you consider doing a talk on the GLP-1s and liver issues going forward? Yeah, I would. I wish the endocrinologists would address it, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to do my amateur work on that because I think they're very, very important. And there, there are many different ones and they're, they're not free of side effects. Um, and I mean, tercepatide being the most potent, which just, wait, I guess they call it a Wegovi now. Um, sh sure. So I can put something to, to, together on that, but 
if that uh, is of an interest, we could always try to set up a panel with you and an endocrinologist. That would work. That'd be good because you'd probably try to kill each other, but um, <laughs> that would be fun. We'll make sure it's the, a, a nice the, one. Um, um, one of the, <clears throat> when I was uh, working at Ohio State, I wanted to get a combined clinic with endocrinology. So the patient would go to one place, they didn't have to go to two places, and we could fight it out. And they never would let us do it because they didn't want to hear what we had to say <laughs> or what I had to say. But um, uh, you know, I, I think that one of the things about, about diets is if you're not intensely interested in the food, uh, you, you leave it to your dietitians, and it all depends on, on um, the sophistication and, and, and when they were trained and whether they've kept up. I remember when I first got to Ohio State, everybody was reading the uh, ingredients off the package. I don't want a dietitian who reads the ingredients off the package. I don't want people to eat things in packages. By the time I left, the dietitians were fabulous. I mean, they, uh, they were really on top of things. They, were, they, they did a great job. I learned so much from um, following them around and, and seeing how, you know, how they did a history and so forth. They did so much better job than I did in terms of uh, actually getting an honest um, uh, food intake uh, report. So yeah, we, we that would be fine. I'd be happy to do that. Um, particularly, I mean, since 80% of uh, obese male diabetics are, have fatty liver, I mean, it, it has to be included in the management of, uh, of all these patients. Yeah, if you are interested in that, please just send me an email at the request. I'll talk with Dr. Levin, try to find an endocrinologist that they won't kill each other and we'll go from there. Oh, killing uh, each other is okay. That's fine. It's, it's the fun of it. <laughs> Next yeah. question. Can you speak a bit about when to suspect something other than uh, NAFLED, a non-drinker with mild alt elevation? Well, <clears throat> sure. The... Um, if, if you're a non-drinker and you don't have fat, there are a lot of other things that you can have. You can have, um, you know, if you're young, you can have um, Wilson disease. That usually isn't subtle when you get old. You, if you, you can have uh, hereditary hemochromatosis. You can get have autoimmune liver disease. Uh, people with um, 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 celiac disease, for instance, will often have mild... Uh, hepatitis and the liver chemistries will be abnormal, which will get better with a gluten-free diet. It's amazing how uh, I used to see a lot of these people with celiac disease and they'd go to a conference or something. They claimed that they stuck to the diet and they come back and their liver chemistries would be quite a bit elevated. You know, a month later, they'd be fine. So it's not uncommon for people to get a break in their diet, particularly if they, they, they get out of the home uh, and cause those kinds of things. But everything's possible, and you know. But and you know, there's still you know there's hepatitis uh, A, B, C, D, E. I mean, there's everything, and um, so you have to um, you know consider uh, consider those. Thanks. Um, oh, so to clarify the prior question, there's an example was an obese patient with an ALT in seventies other LFTs normal. What is your typical starting workup? We know that some patients with fatty liver disease develop cirrhosis with normal chemistries. So that doesn't get you off the hook. I would <clears throat> do um, a, a FIB4 and I would do an ultrasound uh, of the liver. And, uh, and you would be surprised some of these patients actually have fatty liver. And Again, I would try to address uh, the obesity. Um, and again, I, I think that even a, a, a partial improvement in your diet, you know, substituting more, you know, it's, it's, you know the, the whole bit is eat vegetables and not too much of anything. I think that if you enrich your diet with you know, salads and cooked vegetables and fruit, even if you don't eliminate all the bad things you eat, that will still make a very significant difference. There was just recently an article in the last week or so on the fact that, that even a partial improvement of diet can have a profound effect. So I would, you know, now some people will tell you, I don't really care. I'm not going to do anything. So, you know, that's, that's their, their, their choice. But a lot of people will make relatively minor changes that will make a marked improvement in their overall health. Um, and again, you're, you're kind of obliged to check for 
things like viral hepatitis. So if you have hepatitis B, for instance, it can be smaller along and, and, and not cause major changes, but still be a significant problem that you may have to treat. Great. All right, I don't see any other questions. If you do think of a question after the session, um, we can always log into our VC platform and uh, send Dr. Levin a e-consult or any of our volunteers with any of your uh, questions. Um, yeah, I don't see anything else. So Dr. Levin, thank you so much. Uh, I think it was a great session. Uh, and um, if, again, if you want to check out any of his other previously recorded sessions, you can do that on the clinic portal. All of our sessions are recorded and put it up there, or you can request a session. Um, you know, Dr. Levin is always, always available for us. Um, but Dr. Levin, thank you again for joining us today, and I'm glad that your cough is better. Thank you very much. All right.